Welcome back to the channel. For those who are new here, my name is Dr. Martin Rutkowski, and I'm an assistant professor of neurosurgery with expertise in brain tumors. In today's follow-up video to the one I released yesterday on the initial autopsy results in Bob Saget's tragic death, I'll discuss new details that have emerged regarding the severity of his injuries. Initial reports indicated that Mr. Saget entered his hotel room at 2.17 a.m. on January 9th, and then was found by security the next day after failing to respond to his family or check out of his hotel room. When they entered his room, there were no signs of foul play. His room was orderly with items on the nightstand, closet, and bathroom, and he was found in bed with his left arm across his chest with no signs of trauma. The chief medical examiner's report concluded that Mr. Saget suffered an unwitnessed fall backwards and struck the posterior aspect of his head. The manner of death is accident. But the story seems to have changed significantly, and in my opinion, the nature of his injuries do not support this orderly explanation of a simple accident. As of now, the afternoon of February 11th, Mr. Saget's further released autopsy results reveal more specific, severe, and extensive injuries to his head that contradict the initial reports. Mr. Saget suffered abrasion of the posterior scalp, subgaleal hemorrhage underlying the abrasion, linear fracture of the base of the skull, comminuted fractures of the roofs of the orbits involving the bilateral frontal bone, bilateral partial periorbital ecchymoses, subdural hematoma, subarachnoid hemorrhage, contracute contusions involving the bilateral frontal lobes and bilateral temporal lobes. Now let's break those down so that you all understand how severe and extensive they are. I'll leave it up to you to agree or disagree whether or not the story we have around his death explains the significance of these injuries. An abrasion or scratch of the posterior scalp certainly makes sense. A subgaleal hematoma refers to a blood collection below the galea, the third layer of the scalp, which possesses five total tissue layers. In a strange coincidence, I just released a video last week explaining how this type of injury occurred in UFC 247 as the result of severe and direct blows to the head. I'll link that video here. A linear fracture of the base of the skull is a type of injury that only comes with severe head trauma. The base of the skull is deep within the head, protected either by the outside of the skull, the calvarium, or by the muscles and tissue layers of the upper neck. The force required to generate a basilar skull fracture is very significant and not typically seen with accidental ground level falls. Comminuted fractures of the roofs of the orbits involving the bilateral frontal bone further attest to the incredible force his head must have sustained. A comminuted fracture is one in which the bone is broken into multiple smaller pieces rather than a single fracture, and this appears to have occurred in the bilateral orbits or the bony housing that surrounds the eyeballs. The frontal bone helps make up the roof of the orbits, and so concurrent injuries make sense. So far, this pattern of injury suggests that he suffered forceful blows to the front and back of his skull, and the bilateral partial periorbital ecchymoses, or bruises around the eyes, are consistent with his orbital injuries, in addition to the basilar skull fracture. We frequently see bruising in this area from direct trauma to the orbits or due to a deep skull fracture, a feature termed raccoon eyes. I explained subdural hematoma in my first video on his death, a blood collection that forms between the surface of the brain and the dura, its protective outermost covering. While the dura forms the outermost covering of the brain, there are actually two additional layers to the meninges that help protect the brain, known as the arachnoid, a transparent veil of tissue just superficial to the cortical surface, and the pia, a very thin membrane tightly adherent to the brain tissue itself. Blood that forms beneath the arachnoid as a response to trauma is common and is called traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage. Some of you may also have heard of subarachnoid hemorrhage that can form when an aneurysm ruptures because the major blood vessels that feed the brain pass through the subarachnoid space. And finally, Mr. Saget had contracoup injuries involving the bilateral frontal and temporal lobes. Contracoup injury refers to the secondary injury caused by a ricochet phenomenon. When something injures the skull and brain, the force transmits into the brain and causes its opposite side to crash against the inside of the skull, generating further injury. For example, head trauma to the right side of the skull would transmit into the right temporal lobe and then push the brain against the left inside aspect of the skull, injuring the left temporal lobe. These injuries are also commonly seen when the brain undergoes high impact under significant speed or force. So there we have it. These are not injuries caused by a bump to the head or simple head trauma, nor would I expect something this severe to be caused merely by blood thinners or vascular disease. 
These are incredibly serious and severe signs that major head trauma has been suffered. In my career and personal experience, I've only seen injuries like this with high-speed accidents, such as motorcycle crashes, serious car accidents, or falls from great height. I have no idea what happened to Mr. Saget, but none of these injuries are in line with the orderly scene encountered by security when they first found him. So there we have it. These are not injuries caused by a bump to the head or simple head trauma, nor would I expect something this severe to be caused merely by blood thinners or vascular disease. These are incredibly serious and severe signs that major head trauma and traumatic brain injury has been suffered. In my career and personal experience, I've only seen injuries like this with high-speed accidents such as motorcycle crashes, serious car accidents, or falls from great height. Now, I have no idea what happened to Mr. Saget, but none of these injuries are in line with the orderly scene encountered by security when they first found him. The story initially released made it seem like a simple accident had caused Mr. Saget's subdural hematoma. While I have seen several examples of subdural hematoma caused without a clear history of recent head trauma, these so-called spontaneous subdural hematomas are probably occurring in patients who don't remember suffering head trauma. It takes some sort of force, even in patients with risk factors such as blood thinner use or vascular disease, to cause a subdural hematoma. The smallest accident or head strike may be enough, but there should be some antecedent event that caused it. That's why this story makes less and less sense as further details are released. This was not just a simple subdural hematoma. While that may have been the specific injury that caused his death, the collection of severe injuries indicates a similarly severe mechanism of injury. I just can't understand how a simple fall backwards could cause this. It doesn't make any sense. So what do you think? If you have further details on his autopsy results, please let me know in the comments below. Something tells me that there will be more to this story as time passes, so stay tuned. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next video.